I decided after I created that style of yoga to add another style, <laughs> which is called the yoga shred. <laughs> it's so fun because I wanted to bring in that, that next cross training for yoga people and make sure that we have all the benefits that our body is capable of giving us. Um, but I didn't really want to go to the gym style stuff. So I took a lot of the gym style stuff for inspiration, like CrossFit moves and high intensity interval training, which is called HIT the best exercise known to man in the least amount of time. And I created my own moves out of yoga-based postures. So yoga people could get cardio optimized, get their fast twitch muscles doing what they're meant to do and still get superhero strong for their yoga practice too. Namaste. You're listening to the Savannah Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavannahSpirit.com, the best place to shop for unique clothing, spiritual handcrafted jewelry, healing gemstones, and fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now, here's your host, Brett Larkin. Hello, Savannah family. Thank you so much for listening, for being here, and for all the love you give the show. Remember your ratings and reviews here on iTunes, even if iTunes isn't how you normally listen to the show, mean so much to me and get the show in front of more people looking to transform their life through yoga and meditation. Life transformation is very relevant for today's guest. Sadie Nardini was sentenced to life in a wheelchair and then healed herself through movement. Today, we're going to talk to her about her personal journey, and we're really going to hopefully expand your idea of what the core is. I think the core gets talked about all the time in yoga, right? We need core strength. And our goal in this episode is to really expand your idea of the core from just six abdominal muscles to multiple head-to-toe interconnecting fascial lines that make up your physical and emotional support system. Sadie's going to walk us through the seven cues that activate your core strength for a safer, stronger yoga practice. And she's also going to tackle that complex question, which is, is yoga enough? Is cross-training necessary? And she's going to be telling us about how she's been combining mantra, yoga, and little cardio workouts inspired by HIT and Tabata for optimal health and well-being. If you don't know who Sadie is, she is a full-spectrum transformation advocate, renowned speaker, and yoga and anatomy expert. Sadie, I would love for the listeners to get to know you better, and I want to hear your story as well, because what I've heard is that you were actually paralyzed for two years before coming and finding the yoga practice. Is that true? Well, partially, yes. And the reason I say partially is because when I was a teenager, I was 13 and I was in a swimming pool in Iowa, a grown man jumped on my head, full on cannonballed straight onto my head and broke my spine and my neck in three places. So I was partially paralyzed for two years, which means I could crawl and move sort of, but I was I had, I had no muscle tone or activation hardly at all over my whole body. So I was extremely weak and they did not know if that was ever going to change. So I was told to get a wheelchair and um, that I would never run, certainly, or exercise. Maybe I would walk, but it was just kind of a wait and see thing. So from 13 to 15, I was down for the count. Wow, that is unbelievable. And, and then what led you to being able to move again? Well... You know, the doctors basically gave up on me and it was just my mom and I in this apartment. She pulled this dusty old yoga book off the shelf. It was Richard Hittleman's 28-day yoga program or something. And it was from the 60s. This woman had horrible fashion. It was some flesh-colored unitard, which may explain my love of unitards to this day. But, um, you know, she, she wasn't in great alignment, but it had a lot of breathing and a lot of gentle and restorative postures that I could do. So I did not start out being this kind of rock and roll, you know, empower yourself and I'm doing lunges and I'm, I'll get you into a handstand and all of that. It it started with me very therapeutically and I would be in those restorative poses sometimes for hours. So I got to know myself and my breath and that inner space I had to find because the outer body was so chaotic all the time. Um, so that's how yoga kind of found me. It was sitting on my shelf waiting for me to have a life trauma and partner up with it. 
And now over 10 years, it took me to get to a place where I was strong enough to even go into a yoga class, a beginner one, and hope for the best. (laughs) So obviously it was a miracle when you started walking and being able to exercise again. And that was all just through your own self-healing, it sounds like. Were the medical people just floored or... (laughs) Yeah, I revisited some of those doctors 10 years later, and they were absolutely stunned. They had no idea. And if if you'd seen the x-rays of my neck, um, I was lucky I wasn't killed. But my my spinal cord was impacted really badly. So there's no way to tell how that's going to heal. I just, it, it was a miracle. And I do credit yoga with putting my spine back into alignment for hours and hours and maybe allowing my body to heal itself more optimally. I like to think so. So you enter your first yoga class. How old are you at this point? Wow. I would have been about mid twenties. Mid twenties. Wow. So very long recovery from teenagehood to mid twenties. And now you're finally in a yoga classroom, yoga context. What was the next step for you in realizing that this was a passion of yours and something that you wanted to teach? Well, it's funny. I never thought I would do or get into yoga as a thing. I mean, I I saw it as a healing personal practice at home. I never thought about teaching. I never really had a calling to teach, I didn't think. But I saw this woman in a gym at the University of Washington where I was going to college. And she was glowing, just a beautiful woman. I asked her what she did and because I was actually thinking of going to the gym and not, not to yoga. And funny enough, I was looking for the ab cruncher, like the, the core. I thought I needed more core strength. They, everyone says that. So, And I asked her what she did to look like that and glow like that. And she said, oh, I'm a yoga teacher. Why don't you come to class today? And I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to go lie down for hours again. And I want to actually work out. So I guess I'll have to work out after that and I'll be here all day. But I am a nice person, so I told her that I would go to class. I get to class, and it's Ashtanga, primary series. And I, you know, for those of you who don't know that, it is strong, it's moving, you're expected to do things that my body was not ready for. So I tried some stuff, and I would shake. I just remember years of of doing down dog and shaking, doing chair pose, shaking, doing pigeon. And my body had been so bound up for years that I was eight feet off the floor with 15 blocks, you know? And um, that first class, I had to walk around the room. I didn't know you had to stay on your mat. So I I would do something and shake and get up and walk around and be like, woo, talk to people in their down dogs. Like, is this as hard for you as it is for me? Oh my gosh, like, woo. she, (laughs) She said, Sadie, can you here's child's pose. Just do this whenever you get tired, even if you have to do it a hundred times in a class. And please get in the back row so you're not distracting everybody. (laughs) So I got in the back row. I did child's pose a hundred times that class. I'm not kidding. Every, Every other minute. And then I did it 99 times the next class. And 98 times the time after that. And I chipped away at it. And after three years of taking this woman's classes, six days a week, I she left and went to India and certified me to teach in her style. So I started out being personally certified by a teacher in the old methods and uh, was like, well, I have to teach. Otherwise, I'll have no yoga class to take. There wasn't any more in Seattle at that time because I'm old. So, you know, <laughs> I had to step up. This is amazing. So I think this is such a great story because for those of you that just see you online or see what you've built or or the amazing courses and products and everything you have now, you are so strong. I mean, everything's about core strength and it's, it's awesome. But to know that you come from this place where you not only had no core strength, I mean, you could barely walk and move around. And I think that's a really great message because so many people, I think, do feel bad that you know, they're taking child's pose or that maybe it's taking them a really long time to be able to master that plank chaturanga up dog transition. And, you know, here you're, you're telling us that it literally took years. It took me years. So when I teach a population or a classroom of people, I, I may never have had their specific injury or their specific illness, but I do know what it, what it's like to start from the ground up to build strength at that level. And I can, modify and have compassion for every single student in the room, which I think is something that a lot of people don't know about me. Looking at my practice now, just from the outside, like here's an image you see on Instagram or here's, you know, fit fierce over 40, woohoo. They don't know that they're going to get met where they are instead of me rolling them over 
and steamrolling them. Like I see a lot of teachers do nowadays, like, oh, here's my practice. You just keep practicing till you get here instead of let me meet you where you are and then help you take one step forward from there. And if you can do that, try this. And at some point you have to honor that you have limitations and love yourself up right where you are because yoga is not something that physically we want to progress for an entire lifetime. Spiritually, emotionally, yes, but you know, we can't take a forward bend and then bend through our legs and then kiss our own asana, you know? <laughs> some some physical limitations are healthy. That's called boundary. Mm. So we have to kind of dance where we are and deepen there. That's what I teach. And I um I see a lot of people judge me when they see the mohawk and I like to wear black and I'm not your average yogi and I drink wine and I have a strong practice. But when they take my courses or they come to see me at a workshop, um, I've, I've seen them change completely and understand that I'm here to nourish and nurture as well as empower. If you're into boho style and ethical gifts, check out savannaspirit.com. They have beautiful, flowy clothing and unique finds like Tibetan singing bowls, sage, incense, and mala necklaces. It's a great online shop for the spiritualist. Use the discount code PODCAST30 for 30% off your first order today. So the style of yoga that you really founded is this core strength vinyasa style of yoga. And I think, again, from the outside, that's like, oh, it's yoga plus fitness. But I know that there's a much deeper definition of the core and how you think about core strength. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Well, you know, as I was building back into strength, I had to start from the ground up and the inside out. And the way that I had to move was very organic. It was an efficiency of movement, as you can imagine. Um, And I built myself from, I felt like a, a skeleton from an inner power into more outer expression and stretch and, and strength and all that. So when I got into some yoga classes early on, I saw the complete opposite was happening and I was very confused. Like we were going for shapes and stretch over that inner power or playing with the earth and moving as dancers move, moving as we walk, as we you know get up from a couch, anything. We don't get up with straight limbs we don't shake hands with a straight arm and straight legs and walk like robots. So I was curious why we were going super linear the entire time we were practicing. So I was so confused and I was starting to hurt myself. My joints were aching. I was, you know, in my 30s and I was tearing down already. I'd ask my teachers, how do I fix this? My knees hurt. My jaw is tense. My wrists hurt. And they would say, oh, well, keep practicing. But it seemed like practice was hurting me. So I decided to just bust out of the whole thing for a moment. And I spent a decade studying with anatomy masters like Leslie Kamenoff, who wrote the beautiful book, co-wrote it, Yoga Anatomy. Um, And by proxy through him, Tom Myers, who did all of these muscle meridian studies, how muscles interconnect and do different things for the body. Uh, Paul Grilly, the bone and joint guy. And I found that there was a lot of therapeutic and biomechanical knowledge out there that yoga teachers either didn't know or they didn't understand how to put together to teach a class and align a pose from the ground up in a way that's more empowering and gives us about twice the results for every pose. So I had to create my own method because I couldn't find it anywhere else. And the key differentiators for your method, tell us about that so people can really visualize it at home. The, I, again, clearly there's a focus on the core, but t- tell us more about that. Like I know you often talk about this idea of there being a core meridian and I love Tom Myers and have taken a lot of his work and do myofascial release and all that stuff. So I'm also very personally interested in, in that. So then you know that Tom is this brilliant, uh, you know, anatomist and And he dissected a million bodies and found that we don't have singular muscles that just do a thing. We have muscles that are interwoven through fascia, which is your connective tissue for people who don't know, like a a spider webbing through everything around everything that you have. And some of those, what he calls muscle meridians that run from your feet through your whole body and connect to each other. Some of them do different things. So 
there's a couple of lines called the superficial back line and superficial front line. You know it if you've studied him. And the superficial back line is what we overuse a lot in yoga. It's the, it's the kind of bring yourself up from a forward bend by reverse swan diving with arms out. And you kind of arch your back up because you have to. That's the way that most people move. And we get a lot of this movement in our yoga postures transitioning from pose to pose. Uh, a lot of it is done through this like archy back body thing. And then if we try to counteract that with what we think is the core, we're kind of going into the creepy line, I call it. It's the superficial front line. It flexes you, it hunches you over. And that those two lines actually really shorten and compress your spine, your SI joint, your hips, um, and pretty much disempower your whole body from working with gravity and the earth. We need this thing called the ground reaction force, which is a physics bounce that you get if you move properly. Otherwise, if we're inorganic and like arching and hunching and trying to stay straight all the time, we can really miss out on so many of the benefits from another line. It's called the deep front line in Tom's world. And um, I call it the deep core line. It's the only muscle that bridges your legs to your spine, the muscle meridian. It's the only meridian that can help you travel that ground reaction force up through your body in a way that decompresses your spine and your joints and makes you taller, not shorter. So knowing the muscles that connect through the deep core line, knowing what order you have to activate them in, knowing that when you do it enough times, it becomes a wave-like, amazing, beautiful vinyasa or flowing motion. Uh, I did not see that being taught in transition anywhere. So I created seven core cues that anyone can do or teachers can teach to get people through the deep core line properly between every pose. And it makes a huge difference. I mean, I've, I've erased SI joint pain in yoga practice in one session with a thousand people. Are some of those cues something you can share with us or, or give us a hint so people can get a sense of what they are? <laughs> like, I'm going to leave y'all hanging. Yeah, yeah I, I mean... mean... <laughs> Good luck figuring it out. Um, you know, and this is where I, I don't, I will say it, but I'm the only reason I hesitate is because I don't want people going out and trying it or teaching it without deeper study, obviously, because you'd have to. So if you want to study more deeply, um, we'll tell you about my website at the end of this. And I have by donation trainings. You can give a dollar or more for five day training on this and make sure that you know what you're doing. But generally, um, the first thing we have to do, which is very counterintuitive for many yoga people who've been practicing kind of the more linear type of form is what I call um, neutralize. And that is to soften, to bend the limbs. Let's say you're in a forward bend and you want to make it up to mountain pose with your arms in the air. Most people will come up with a straight spine, straighter legs and reach their arms out and up or whatever. All that stuff is super stressful on your joints and you're deactivating a lot of muscle power and potential. Um, and you'll end up short in the low back and the SI again and again and the shoulder joints. So anyway, neutralize is the first core cue. Let's say you're in a forward fold. You would bend the knees a lot, a lot more than you think. Let your spine hang, let your head hang, let your arms go soft, wave your rib cage and spine from side to side and start to intake the breath in a really soft rhythmic way. I want to deactivate with this cue the whole outer body, all the meridians that we can so that we can refine and reactivate the deep core line first instead of last as it usually is. So the second core cue is grounding wave and that means whatever's on the ground in this case, your feet will press down. The third cue, and this is kind of simultaneously, is called a Y wave. And that means to take your sitting bones and inner groins back and wide. It's almost like you're running energy up from your feet up through the inner thighs and out through the sitting bones. So that deepens the groins and hip creases and joints. That makes your center of gravity optimized. And it kind of gives you the space to run what's coming next, the ground reaction force up through that deep core line. So anyway, neutralize. Um, you can do the Y wave second, just get ready. I'll, I'll make it easier for you guys. And then the grounding wave is third, press down through your feet right away. And here's where a lot of yoga people kind of miscommunicate with their bodies. Um, the next wave is called so, the psoas wave. And the psoas is a wild muscle that runs from your inner thighs over the front of your pelvis, under all the organs and spins up your low back spine to spirals. That is your deepest core strength power right there. But most people will arch the back to get up. So instead, I 
um, and cue people. The psoas wave is like little kitty cat paws running up the front of your spine. <laughs> like, who just pull that front spine in and up a little as you start to stand. Once your pelvis and spine is stacked in a standing position, um, the lumbar wave is next. And that kind of makes sure that the back of your low back is in and up properly, nice and curved, but it's supported from the front. So as power. Then axial wave is next. You get some length through the whole spine, length through the bones and joints. And the last cue, the seventh one is refine. And that's just something that, you know, maybe you breathe or maybe you refine something else about the pose. So those are the seven core cues. And at first it's kind of robotic, but after a while it becomes this beautiful, holistic, powerful wave and dance with the earth that is so awe-inspiring to watch and anyone can do it from the first time they get on the mat. It's pretty beautiful. Wow. I love the description you gave us. It sounded like at the beginning when you were talking what I was visualizing, I want to know if I'm, I have it kind of right. It's almost like you want to soften like when at the very, the first, I think two or three steps, it's like a softening of the outer shell of the body to kind of disengage that front and back line and find a new re-engagement in that core line that you're talking about, like moving from the, the inside out as opposed to the outside in. Am I kind of picturing it right? Absolutely. And that allows the outer body to activate and fire naturally instead of trying to take over for the inner core line, the core body that we all have to help to lift us from the earth and express us. And this is a physical version of what we talk about every day in yoga with confidence, empowerment, self-worth, self-value, and finding your satya or your truth and expressing that from the inside out. We don't say, oh, grab onto everything external that you can, be super inorganic in the way that you move, um, get stressful, and then maybe there'll be a little flame of your inner strength in there somewhere. Find it later. We would never teach that, but we move like that a lot in yoga. So I'm just trying to teach transitions in a, in a new way that reminds people of the power and strength they have and that they can't do it alone. They have to do it in community. And that community in this case is with the, the mat underneath you and the earth, the earth's core below that. Mm, beautiful. I love it. I wanted to ask you next about something that I know is pretty controversial, <laughs> which is this idea of is doing yoga enough, right, in terms of our fitness regime? Does yoga ask of us enough movements that it really can be like the only thing that we're doing? What is your take on that? Well, it depends on what you're using it for. You know, if, if you're somebody who doesn't, you're not really trying to attain cardiovascular <laughs> optimization, which means how well you can deal with it when your heart rate rises and, and how well you, you know, intake oxygen and process it. If they're not looking to really tone and sculpt the muscles, if a few other things, then they can do just yoga. Yoga is a wonderful spiritual practice, as we all know. It's wonderful physically. It's very cleansing with our inversions and our exhales. And it gives us slow twitch muscle fiber activity, which is endurance based. So the, we get to a place, yeah, we flow, but it's a slower movement. And then we're holding for a while. That's endurance based for sure. Something I noticed after 25 years of practicing yoga is that I was unable to join my friends in running up a hill. I couldn't even, I would die. My brother tried to get me to go jogging with him and I just, I couldn't even. And it's funny because I'm very strong in a, in a different way, but cardiovascularly, I was losing it. You just don't get your heart rate up as high as you need to. Short, intensive bursts as science now shows us we need to really optimize our fast twitch muscle action, which we're not really moving fast in yoga ever. So we lose that muscle kind of tightening and toning and definition. We lose the ability to move quickly. And if we do, the fuel, the fuel is off for us. The heart rate um, is not used to being up so high. It can really throw us off as yogis. So I decided after I created that style of yoga to add another style, <laughs> which is called the yoga shred. <laughs> it's so fun because I wanted to bring in that, that next cross training for yoga people and make sure that we have all the benefits that our body is capable of giving us. Um, but I didn't really want to go to the gym style stuff. So I took a lot of the gym style stuff for inspiration, like CrossFit moves and high intensity interval training, which is called HIT. 
the best exercise known to man in the least amount of time. And I created my own moves out of yoga-based postures. So yoga people could get cardio optimized, get their fast twitch muscles doing what they're meant to do, and still get superhero strong for their yoga practice too. I want you to describe a yoga shred class and the kind of things that we're doing in it more because I'm very intrigued, obviously. And I know one thing I've struggled with when I go to more of those gym style yoga classes as a yogi is that all the movements are so fast, right? It's like do a bunch of crunches and then jump up and then sit down and then, you know, and, and for someone, I think just being a yoga teacher, you know, you're so body aware, even people who have a hardcore practice, it's like, this does not feel good on my low back to like jump up, sit down, squat with a dumbbell, you know, and it's at this crazy pace. So how does it work in yoga shred that you're integrating this like hit and CrossFit type movements with, with uh, yoga? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I became very annoyed with that style too. I don't want to go into a place that's like the discos that I'm getting too old to even want to be in anymore. And <laughs> like the parties, you know, raves and the, the flashing lights and the, and the music. And it's just a sensory overload. I mean, I practice yoga to feel grounded and centered and empowered and, and in self mastery. So I thought, well, can, can we get both and still have the sensation that you're in a yoga practice? Um, the speed of the poses doesn't really bother me as long as there's a balance of both. Because if you watch Iyengar from, you know, the 30s on, that dude was doing super fast vinyasa, like up, down. I mean, I couldn't even keep up with it. So the speed of things I don't think makes or breaks the yoga. I think it is um, the intention with which you're doing it. And we do need cross-training as yoga practitioners. And for anyone who doubts this right now, I would invite you to go and we'll give you all those links, but I'd invite you to go on to any one of my free yoga shred workouts on YouTube and try it and tell me if you feel like, oh, I got this. I'm, I'm fine just doing yoga. Um, if there's work to do, then you might try it. So in answer to your question, um, here's what it looks like to do a yoga shred class. Luckily, the shreds are very intense. They are challenging, but they can be modified for any body um, and, and most joint needs but they don't last long because you can't do them for very long. So they're four minute rounds, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off for four minutes. This is known as Tabata timing and it's shown to be one of the best timings for this type of exercise there is. And we'll give you the benefits. And I'm talking muscle tone, um, DNA repair deeply, uh, fat burning, calorie burning, if that's what you're looking for, as if you have worked out for two to four hours in four to 12 minutes. And this is just exercise science. We've known about this forever, but yoga people have not reaped the benefits of it. So, Yeah, I've heard about this timing with the Tabata or whatever. It's very intriguing. And when you say, I want to really picture this and for listeners to be able to like see it in their mind at home too. So like when you say a four minute round, does that mean we're doing maybe something like a burpee or something with weights or something that's like getting our heart rate up really high? So I made sure to use my anatomy and alignment knowledge to redo Anything that I took from a practice that like a hit practice, like a burpee, I call them, I have yoga, yoga burpees because, and I have like five different types of them, depending on different poses that we like to attain, like core strength poses or arm balances or standing poses, balance, all of that. But I realign them to make them way safer on the joint because there's no way anyone should ever do a burpee with straight legs and arms ever again. You always land with bent legs and pull that navel in and up as you land. And if you can't do it and jump far back, you start closer in. You can do them with your forearms on a couch or a chair. You can do them in so many different ways to avoid all the joint issues that can arise from a straight up gym-like practice. So I only took about two or three things people will recognize. The rest are mine. Um, so here's what it looks like. You warm up with a seated yoga breath warm up, a core strength breath get centered. You do a slow flow on the floor. Then you do some sun salutations. Usually they're my style to teach the anatomy and alignment of the deep core line. And then we do one to four rounds of four minute things based on yoga poses like fist of fire chair or fierce temple pose, forearm down dog kicks of fire and stuff that really builds you for your poses, belly bonfire pose. All of these things are built to really amp up the inner and outer body for yoga practice, but just in general. 
And that's great too, because like yoga people would be more familiar with these shapes than like random shapes we saw if we went to the gym. (laughs) And after each four minute burst, because they get your heart rate up pretty high if you're doing them correctly, we do a little um, dedicated stretch and cool and stretch out for that particular pose, just to make sure we're not ending up tight in places that we don't need to be. And when you do yoga stretches for the yoga shreds, you gain 75% more muscle density and tone because you got space in your muscle fibers after you stretch them out. Um, so we do three, you know, one to three, four rounds of that four minutes, four would be max. And then we cool down with 10 minutes or so or longer of a uh, yoga kind of yoga melt, I call it, where we specifically have cool down sequences for the types of shreds that we just did. The whole practice lasts 30 minutes to, it could be 20 minutes for you if you really want to get through it, um, 30 minutes or so. And of course, if you're a teacher, you could extend that in the beginning and the end with more yoga. But I, I teach shorter form classes for people who are busy and want to get all the benefits of yoga and hit in one session. And what props or tools does someone need? I mean, do we need some three or five pound weights or chairs or anything like that? No. You know, most people have difficulty finishing out a round just with body weight. I mean, the body body weight is awesome. And I don't really, I don't love adding on inorganic amounts of weight. I love working with your body. And hey, if you get really used to something and you can do it in alignment and it's getting easier for you, then I have a more challenging variation for you to try. Or you can do it faster or you can do it you know, in some way that's more challenging for you. That's what I would do. So you need a yoga mat and a yoga block. Same as yoga. We don't even move off our mats. We just woohoo after every four minutes. It's very empowering without triggering this kind of you know, uh, agro central nervous system, like you can get in some of the gym classes. We stay very mindful. We exhale and inhale through the mouth, which is different during the shreds because we'll pass out. (laughs) We don't, you need more oxygen, but it's very, they're, they're like breaths of fire and lion's breath and ha ha and, and mantra for empowerment. You know, it's, it's a pretty fun thing. And then we go, we flow back into the cool down, nose breathing and and rebalancing. And it it ends up feeling like you just did a yoga class for about an hour and a half, but you've only been on the mat for 30 minutes. This podcast was brought to you by Savannah Spirit, an online shop for yoga clothing, healing jewelry, and unique spiritual fair trade gifts. This week, they're featuring their Himalayan salt lamps. They're not only a gorgeous, glowing home decor feature, but they also emit beneficial healing ions into the air that protect you from EMFs. Search salt lamps on savannaspirit.com to learn more. Use the discount code PODCAST30 for 30% off your first order. Well, I'm definitely intrigued and want to try it. And for, for you personally, or what do you recommend, like coming back to this idea of is yoga enough? And, you know, what for, for the people who, you know, maybe want to look really toned and, you know, hot like you, right? So uh, d- d- should, are you also like running or doing more intense cardio or just the yoga shred with these four minutes is sort of like filling that cardio checkbox? Yeah, you know, I took myself on a little bit of a journey because I I did this yoga shred course online, 21 day yoga shred to see what people thought of it, to get feedback. And that thing to this a year later has sold 75,000 different people have gotten this. So I made another one this month just came out. 19,000 people got it in a month already. Like people love this. And so to kind of be in solidarity with this new um, form, I decided to not do other forms of exercise, but to really only do 20 minutes of exercise a day. Because if I'm going to tell people you can do short form exercise and still not be tight and get your yoga stretches in and feel detoxified and cardio, all the stuff I'm saying, I want to be a role model for that. So I have not worked out for more than 20 minutes a day for a year. And I'm almost 46. I look and feel better than I ever have. I'm strong. And I I had to go into a two-hour yoga class because I was teaching a retreat with someone and I wanted to go to her class. And hey, so I went in and I remember a year and a half ago, I went to her same class and it was so hard for me. So I'm hydrating before class, I'm eating a banana, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm nervous. 
like how how much is this going to kill me like a little bit or a lot and i went in there and it felt like almost a beginner class for me it was easy i had no problem with the exact same practice that i'd had a big problem with a couple years before and this this really works i can run i'm not getting winded but i don't i don't go on targeted other exercise days besides this right now no, I love it. You're a, a firm believer in just doing what you're doing. And I think to to kind of wrap up, I want to ask you some questions about maybe a little bit more what your spiritual practice looks like, because not that, that everything you've talked about can't incorporate spirituality. And I want you to tell us more about the mantra you said that you you sometimes incorporate into these activities. But if you're only working out for 20 minutes a day and look as great as you do, which I find very exciting, it's like, are you also doing meditation or some yoga nidra or, you know, something else that's a part of your personal practice? And can you tell us about that? Yes. So when we say yoga, I think about yoga as something that one does 24-7 in all sorts of different ways as a lifestyle practice and a spiritual practice. What I've been talking about is the exercise portion of our yoga practice. And if we only kind of see what we do on our mat as the yoga practice, then we get very um, death grippy around the idea of, oh, it has to be this pose or this pose that someone else has been doing for a hundred years. It cannot be this shape or this other shape. And that doesn't allow us to explore the totality of our body, of our fitness on the mat. And it, it removes us a little bit from the rest of the practice, which is what happens in the other 23 hours of the day when we got off of the, you know, the mat. So um, what my practice looks like is I have, I have a bunch of different ones. I have, yeah, I do yoga nidra at night if I can't sleep and sometime, and I'll do alternate nostril breathing anyway before I go to bed just to kind of center my brain and my body from the day. I do little bouts of meditation. I sit for five minutes and power down is what I call it. And um, I do meal meditations where I nourish myself properly. I don't rush myself. I do vino meditations where I go and have a glass of Pinot Grigio and sit with my moleskine and write, um, get creatively inspired, cultivate or organize a course that I'm doing or write a song. I have vocal meditations, which I go down into my vocal studio and I warm up with different mantra. And then I sing the seed mantras, which are very, very powerful and important to me, even as a vocalist. And so I'm in a rock band called Sadie and the Tribe. It's a rock band with a yoga message. And so I will warm up vocally. I mean, I spend my whole day walking in service of myself and my students and my creation and my authenticity and my health, because if I don't do it, no one else is going to. And it's up to me. So I've created my life to be something that has a lot of space for me to move from the inside out now. And to do that, I'm coming off the road entirely right now. I'm living in Santa Barbara in a beautiful wooded area, and I'm going to work online and do my music. It's beautiful. It's so exciting. And I love that you share that. It's not like 20 minutes a day and then like yoga is over. It's it's like 20 minutes a day of the the very physical focused, what we might call like the asana portion of the limbs of the yoga sutras. But then your whole day is really spent in this state of yoga or union or authenticity. And I love all the different ways that you're expressing yourself. It's, it's really cool. Um, well, now I have time to because I'm not spending two hours a day in, in asana practice anymore. So I, if I want to restore for another hour, I can do that. I can, I can meditate. I can go take a bath. I can take a nap. I can see my friends. You know, I can do more work on, on my life's goals and dreams. And um, science tells us that we don't need a lot of movement. We just need some each day. And I'm a big fan of having my life back after all those years of over-focusing, in my opinion, on, on the mat. And t- tell us about your mantra practice, because I know you just mentioned that you were in a band, and then when you were telling us about Yoga Shred, you said there's mantras that can be incorporated. So are these, I know you mentioned the seed sounds, but can you give people some, just in case they don't know at home, like what, what those are, if you're using mantra during class, is that like a English affirmation that you're using, or is this a Sanskrit uh, phrase or saying? Generally, when I teach 
workshops or, you know, I, I, I have some kind of vocalization happening throughout for everyone because I think sometimes we bottle up our truth and it's really nice to be able to clear all of that stuff we're bringing up from the earth, from the core and the belly, the pelvis, the spine, up through those centers of expression, like the throat, the mouth, the tongue. And the tongue, strangely enough, is the top of your core line. You probably know this from studying Tom Meyer's anatomy, but um, the tongue is connected to your entire core line body. So when you do things, and this is what we do in class, a lot of fierce, uh, a lot of uh, fierce lion pose, I call it. So it's tongue out or lioness. <laughs> if I'm in the room with a bunch of women, you know, lioness. So we express on the exhale a lot through the ha, <sighs> through the mouth and the tongue. And ha is a known uh, mantra for toning the solar plexus area and cultivating confidence and empowerment. So we, when we do kicks or we do something that's a little bit more fierce, fist of fire, which is, you know, reach up and then fist down by your hips kind of quickly, ha, ha, we express and move that energy through the whole system and out into expression a lot. Very simple. Um, I also love doing Sanskrit mantra. My Some of my favorites, like the removal of obstacles, Ganesha chant, like um, Om Gum Ganapate and Namaha, um, Om Shrim Klim Lakshmi Namaha. So for abundance and seeing the beauty and potential in all things. And we'll chant that sometimes. But my jam are the seed mantras. So singing over and over again, lam, 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 to remove fear and resistance from the root, to get back to the root and connection that you hold, uh, vam, in the belly, to nourish yourself, to remove obstacles to that nourishment, ram, at the solar plexus, the rah, like the confidence you need to bridge your truth into action, um, yam, the heart, so beautiful, yam, Yum, yum. <laughs> to open to more healed relationships from the past and the present and the future. Hum at the throat, self-expression of truth. Om the forehead, and that is being able to see a new perspective on all things and come back to that spiritual nature. And su hum, it's like a waterfall of beautiful prana and, and energy just coming up and out of a cleared system through the crown of the head and showering you with gifts and goodness. <laughs> so those are the ones that I teach, and you know you can get pretty bubbly with all those seed mantras in your class, but they also are great vocal warmups too. So I do that before I go on stage. It's too cool. And thank you for taking us through the chakra seed sounds because I I love it. It was very beautiful how quickly and efficiently you went through that. Sadie, tell everyone where they can do all this cool stuff you've been telling us about. So like, where can they try a yoga shred workout? Where can they connect with you online and perhaps listen to your music? Sure. Well, I mean, everything is housed at my website and that's sadienardini.com. I have a great Facebook page where I'm always posting free stuff and that is uh, facebook.com slash sadienardini official. And my YouTube page is sadienardini. Instagram is sadienardini official. Somewhere like whatever medium you use or, or love, go and check that out. My website will house my new courses and some of the new year, new you stuff and yoga shreds. And you can find wherever else I have things there. So that's me for <laughs> all of next year. Perfect. We're going to put all those links right below this episode. And listeners, let me know what you thought of today's show. You can do that in our private Facebook group at savannaeast.com forward slash group. That's going to redirect you. And of course, you know how much I appreciate and love your ratings and reviews here on iTunes. Even if iTunes isn't how you normally listen to the show, it really helps get the show in front of more people and it means a lot. So I'm curious to hear from you if you're going to try a yoga shred workout. I know that I am definitely going to do one tomorrow morning. So much love. I know I'm excited. So much love to all of you from both Sadie and myself from my heart to yours. Namaste. You've been listening to the Savannah podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.